You're listening to Veg Your Best. There has never been a more important time to be vegan. At Veg Your Best, I want to help you. I want to help you limit and eliminate the consumption of animal products without feeling deprived, overwhelmed, or unsupported, even if no one you know is vegan. My name's Michelle Olander. I'm a life coach. And I know that if I could go vegan in my 50s, With all my excuses, I know you can start moving in that direction too. Veg your best, and there's nothing you can't do. Episode 177, my top two goal-setting tools. Welcome back, my veg your bestie. Welcome back. Back. It's still January, and if you're new here at Veg Your Best, welcome. This is a great time to be joining this community. Now, last week for January goal setting, I called it my backstory. This week, we're talking about my top two tools for goals. My top two tools for goals, and that's to zero in and no zero days. Now, I tried to decide whether these were actually concepts or hacks or mental mindset constructs. Now you see why sometimes it takes me until the last minute to finally record the episode because I keep some of these things in play in my brain with no decision right until the last minute. But I think I decided tools, my top two tools. And I think, well, we might throw in another one. You never know once I start, but my top two tools for goal setting. And yes, we have just come through New Year's, rapidly followed by Quitter's Day. Do you all know about Quitter's Day? I think I only learned about it last year. Could have been the year before. The second Friday in January, they call Quitter's Day. And that's where a large chunk of people, according to researchers and boffins and I think gyms, report that Uh, By the second Friday in January, a large chunk of people say, yeah, no, yeah, no. For the weekend, they kind of punt it and then, well, it's hard to get back, right? So here we are, January 23rd, when this episode drops. And even if you haven't dropped your plan or your goal, you may be losing some steam, you may be losing some focus. And for sure, I would say for sure, focus is really at the heart of the issue for me and for most of my clients. We don't so much fail at our goals. We just kind of forget about them. You know, I'm someone who sets goals for myself throughout the year. Typically, they are not super focused on January 1st. Um, and whenever my clients start working with me, usually they set in, uh, you know, usually they set in motion some sort of goal or intention. And just like them, I have trouble keeping up on my new goals too. And that's because they're new, (laughs) you know, they're new. I have a million things I'm already doing and the new things I just forget that I wanted to do them. It's so easy just to forget. And I know, isn't that the most boring reason you've ever heard to have trouble with your goals? My clients, when they're having trouble, they hardly ever come to me saying, I just keep forgetting about my goals. No, (laughs) they don't usually say that. They usually have a whole story. They have a whole story of how they're broken and goals have always been a problem and maybe maybe goals actually make them feel worse about themselves and it's too late at this point, too late at our ages, right, Michelle? It's change is just too hard after 50 or, you know, I'm not just the monkey in this patriarchal industrial self-help system. That is one I heard recently <laughs> and I agree, you aren't, we aren't monkeys in some sort of patriarchal industrial self-help system. We don't want to be that. But there are things you probably do want to do. So 
Last week, I mentioned one past goal that I thought was really important for me. (laughs) I was convinced of this, that this was really an important goal from a health and discipline point of view, cold water, cold water plunges and cold air exposure. And I happen to be, you know, for a large part of the year, I'm quite close to the Atlantic Ocean. And I know people who Uh, well, even older people, older than I am, who regularly get in and either swim or plunge in cold water. And I thought, you know, for sure, for sure, I should do that, (laughs) right? (laughs) You know, people like Wim Hof, the Iceman, he says it's super healthy. Of course it is. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it would be super, super great for my flighty brain too. Definitely, 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 I thought I should do that. Well, The closest I ever got was turning the shower down to cold-ish a few times. And then I just started to really, really condemn myself about it, you know, and think, gosh, I'm really useless and undisciplined. And, you know, maybe even worse, maybe I'm a real, you know, just hothouse flower who just can't survive in a real world. And just because... I wasn't getting any traction in this goal. I wasn't even doing the goal. So that was a lot of negative self-talk. And then, you know, quite understandably as a self, as a defense mechanism to avoid my scathing beat down, I just kind of forgot about that goal until I looked at the list of goals months later. And I saw for, so clearly I saw that it was an example of a goal that's full of should. It wasn't even really my goal. It seemed like something I should do. I didn't have any particular compelling personal reason to be someone who could pour a Yeti cooler of ice water over my body or someone who could jump off a dock at Thanksgiving or New Year's into a New England harbor. It sounded awesome, but it wasn't my goal, at least not now. Who knows, I may celebrate my 100th birthday that way. That would be awesome, I think. Or I may decide at some point, yeah, I actually have important health reasons to to learn how to do that. But when I thought about it, that goal was full of should for me. A good goal, an excellent goal. If it's your goal, I support you. But it wasn't my goal. Another goal that I had... uh, really failed at in the recent past was keeping my time down on Facebook and Instagram. I knew for sure, like many of you may know, I was wasting way too much time there. But I also had my coaching business and my podcast that I thought were important to to promote and uh, keep an open line of communication towards on, on Instagram especially. And so even when I said, no, 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 I don't want to be on Instagram that much, I would think, wait, I do need to post something today. I do need to remind people there's a new episode out. Or I do have this great uh, vegan company or business or restaurant that I really wanted to share. Or we have this great guest this week and they have a, a book out or a new course. I should remind them you can sign up for my weekly email. Have you signed up for my weekly email, the Veg Your Best V mail? Super easy to do. You can just follow the links in the show notes. But anyway, this is all especially good. Um, Actually, the V-mail is good if you want to stay off social media more because you can stay up to date with uh, Veg Your Best and the guests and the topics without being on Instagram. But anyway, for a long time, my goal was to be off social media most of the time. But my goal was also to grow my podcast. So my goal to be off social media and my goal to grow my podcast and my business were at odds. And I did not have a structure. I did not have a plan. And my phone was a super big tattletale every week telling me how many hours I was on Instagram. And it was clear to me, just like it's probably clear to you, that time is my most precious resource. So how was this even going to work? Because my plan was too vague and it was at cross purposes to this other goal that's important. So unlike learning to increase my cold tolerance, 
limiting my time on social media was, it was actually something, it was actually a goal I did want. I did think it was very important for me personally. So this year, (laughs) this year, hallelujah, I saw you could just put into place a very simple tool on my iPhone. And if you have uh, an Android, I think it is almost exactly the same thing. But on my iPhone, I go to settings and then scroll down and it says screen time. And you tap on screen time and then you get this option of app limits. And I chose a maximum of 60 minutes per day for all social media, not for each of them, but for all of them together. Now, if that had not been enough time. I could have moved it to maybe 90 minutes or even two hours if it was important to me. But 60 minutes has basically worked like a charm since I made that tweak last summer. I have not kept the data of how many times I've overridden it, but I think it's about three or four times. I've only overridden it about three or four times since I started using uh, that lock on my social media. It is easily overridable. There are some apps I think you can do that make it much, much harder to override, but I haven't needed that because the minute I see that time, that warning five minutes and you're at the end, I'm like, oh gosh, I'll just post what I need to post or I'm going to get off and I'll make a note of what I wanted to do tomorrow. Easy, easy. So since that time, I have also been looking for other different ways to lock my phone, to protect my focus when I'm working or writing or trying to concentrate. And your phone does make it quite, quite easy. Yes, it is Satan. Yes, it is trying to suck away your time and your focus, but it also has some great tools. Now, for me, limiting time on Instagram, Facebook, etc., that was not full of should. It was really something I wanted to do, but I was still a little bit stuck on it. So it was hard for me while I was vague until I committed to this very, very simple tool on my iPhone. So if you're on social media or you're on your phone more than you like, I highly recommend that you let your phone help you. It's really easy. It's really easy. And you can message me or email me if you're, if you can't figure it out, but you could also just Google the sentence, how to limit screen time on my phone. I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but for most of us, what stands between doing what we know we want to do and what we're already doing is way simpler than we like to think about it. You know, my phone, when I, when I start coming up to 60 minutes on social media, my phone says, you've got five more minutes. So you've created this tool. I have this tool. You've got access to the same tool. If you're listening to podcasts, I'm sure you've got a phone with a similar skill set that will help you, help you stay focused, remind you, oh yeah, I wanted to not spend more than an hour a day on social media. That still sounds like a lot, doesn't it? An hour a day on social media still sounds like a lot. But anyway, that by not being vague, by being open, by, um, just thinking a little bit more about it, there are, are ways to keep this in your, in your front focus so that you don't forget that your goal was to spend less time on social media. So as I say, it is way simpler to stay focused than we like to think. We like to think. We like to think that we're complicated, magical unicorns with some sort of unique backstory that first needs to be addressed and unraveled and validated and and that goals, at least the way other people do goals, that's impossible for me. And you know what? That may be true sometimes. And when I say maybe, I mean hardly ever, hardly ever. Most of the time, it's much more likely that we just have a goal that's full of should and not ours a goal that doesn't really mean that much to us, or we have a goal that's too vague and there's no structure to remind us that we have that goal. We don't have a system that reminds us that we have some way of ascertaining whether we're making any improvement or getting further along at that 
goal or not. And you know, when my goal for cutting back on social media was too vague, I caught myself a bunch of times going, how is it? How is it? This is three hours on Instagram or am I just going to end up frittering away my entire ADHD life on this nonsense? And those are not good questions. They are not good or helpful questions. They're normal. It is normal to throw your hands in the air when frustrated and ask why me sorts of questions. But if you had a coach, if I were your coach, I would help you redirect your brain towards a little bit better question. A question that might help your brain come up with some strategies. Strategies that honor the fact that yes, sometimes things are hard for you right now. Sometimes new stuff is hard. We want to honor the fact that you have a lot going on right now and new habits and new strategies, they need to be nurtured. You know, a lot of us have very similar sorts of goals, but the strategies that we need to meet those goals, those tend to need to be very custom. Each person has different strategies that they need to put into place. That part is very, um, that is very personal. We want you to make the most progress possible on your goals without triggering any of your own individual level of overwhelm. Now, some goals you just, you just decide to do and then you do it, right? There's no drama. Everybody has had certain things. They've said, oh yeah, I'm changing I'm changing this food or I'm changing where I live or I'm going to look for new appliances that um, are more efficient or I'm going to swap out my car for something when it's when it needs to be traded in that will we, we just make a decision and we follow through it and, and it's not an issue no drama today this month we're talking about goals we have for things we want to do or create that we're not making progress with. So we do that by zeroing in on what the actual goal is, whatever it is, and what that goal, that longer term goal looks like in the course of today. You want to be stronger at the end of the year? Well, what does that look like for you today? You want to finish your degree with a certain GPA. Well, what would that mean for you today? You want to eat a whole food, plant-based diet, but what would that look like when you're eating or cooking or shopping today? Oh, hi, Michelle. You want to finish a rough draft of your book? (laughs) What does that mean today? Now, I have pushed back on this plenty because a lot of my writing goals have actually been goals that were full of should. I recently realized that I had a topic for my book that a few vocal people talked me out of, and they really pushed me very strongly towards another topic. And I could see their reasoning. I really could. I could see their point. But the topic for me was, it was actually full of should. It wasn't my goal. It wasn't my, it wasn't my interest. And even, even though I knew it wasn't my goal, I still thought, you know what, I should just be able to, these people know what they're talking about. I should just be able to get through it. And it would probably be a good use of my time to just uh, do it their way. But it really wasn't what I wanted to do. It really wasn't. And even though I kind of thought, well, that's sort of an immature way of handling this, Michelle. No, wah, I only want to write what I want to write. Actually, that's kind of normal if you're not excited about something. And, you know, writing a book means taking a lot of time away from something else. So I learned this year that my writing goal, as I had defined it last year, was really completely full of should. Completely full of should. So I changed it. I made a decision to stop giving myself a hard time for not making progress on something I something I had realized was not actually my goal, number one. I reframed the goal. I made the outline for what I did want to write about. And then I turned that from something vague 
to something with goalposts. And yes, we know how to do that. We know how to break the goal down into parts. But now I made sure that I have the tool that has become invaluable to me over the last year, no zero days. And some of us first interpret no zero days as meaning we have to be perfect every day, every single day we have to move move forward in a good way. And that's how I did look at it at first, but that consistency does not have to be perfect consistency. No zero days means no matter what, I do something every day on the goal. Something that moves the project forward. Occasionally, that may mean that I just open up the document at the end of the day, just before I go to bed and realize, oh my God, I didn't do anything on it today. I go to my computer, I open up the document, I look at the document, I read over a little bit of what's there, and I write a sentence. I don't let my work completely disappear. I don't, I make sure that I at least touch it every day. No zero days. No zero days. Well, it's what worked for me this year. And if you know, if you know how I am always learning languages, I love languages. I have a lot of materials and PDFs and I have uh, downloaded videos and, you know, audio materials. Um, I have very, very complicated ideas about which ones I want to listen to or watch or read or study and in what order. And I do a lot of it. But no zero days means that every single day I do Duolingo in Spanish, Italian, French, and Polish. Every day. Every day. That just takes a few minutes because Duolingo has these very short, um, I don't know if it's if it counts as AI, but they have these very, uh, these computerized lessons which remember what you had trouble with and they space the things that you didn't get right so that you can always revisit where you need uh, growth. So it takes care of you being kept up to date with what it's taught you. So every single day I do Duolingo in Spanish, Italian, French, and Polish every day. And it, so I will never ever go any more <laughs> weeks and months or years without making any progress at all in one of those languages. And uh, right now, I think I'm 500, uh, it's about 550 days consecutively about Duolingo. And Duolingo, like my, um, like my phone that tells me when I've been on social media too much, Duolingo reminds me that I haven't done anyth anything today. So it keeps track for me. It's a nice tool. No zero days. Also for push-ups. Every single day I do one push-up in the morning and one in the afternoon. And that's been going on for a while now, but it's something I've really learned because I've seen how that has compounded. And yes, I usually do more than one, but even if I do just one, I am maintaining that practice and some of the strength. And yes, every once in a while I go, oh my gosh, it's 10.30 p.m. I'm about to crawl in bed and I remember I didn't do my push-up. So I can just go do one push-up, or three, or ten, but no zero days. And this year I added weighted squat. We'll talk more about what I've added this year. But this past year I added weighted squat, and I consider myself to be in compliance with that, uh, that goal as long as I do one squat holding something. Uh, you know, I, not a toothbrush, but something a little bit heavy, like a stool or a big, big book or a basket of laundry. Uh, if I'm downstairs, a kettlebell. But as long as I do one squat, I'm in compliance with my goal and I'm honoring my goal. No zero days. And it's ratcheted up this year, but I walk every day. Uh, I try to walk even if the weather's not super great. But last year, my goal that I, I set in uh, January of 2023 was uh, 10,000 steps per day to actually have the average on my health app on my, my iPhone, 
10,000 steps. It keeps track for you. Because my, you know, the work I do, recording and uh, coaching and writing, means a lot of sitting. Sometimes I can stand, but it means a lot of not that much movement. So I think it is essential for me to make a concerted effort to be walking a good amount every single day. But 10,000 steps. Have you ever had a child or been the child who would get A's on tests and then not hand in the homework, (laughs) thereby averaging a zero in with a uh, 95%? That is what a zero day is like. Now, if I walk 10,000 steps and then the next day I don't walk at all, okay, now I'm averaging in a zero or close to a zero with 10,000. So this year, well, the year is the year is still young, but my average for the past 11 weeks, according to my phone, is over 14,000 steps a day. And just so you know, your phone knows a lot about you. That 14,000 steps a day average includes uh, two and a half days that I was driving down from New England to Southern Florida, long days in a car, not moving at all. So even on those days, I made a decision to walk around you know, at every little rest stop or anywhere I stopped for food or when I stopped at a motel to go up and down the stairs a couple times so that there were no zero days because I'd much rather average in 1,200 steps than zero steps, right? No zero days is the tool that has helped me over the past years really stay on top of the goals that I set and it is top of mind for the goals that I'm setting going forward this year. This year, it turns 65, and we're going to talk more about those going forward uh, probably next week. But if it's mid-January and your goals, your plans are starting to become kind of amorphous, are starting to feel a bit overwhelming or unrealistic, I want you to remember these two tools. Zero in on whether this is really your goal, whether this is your goal or you're struggling with a goal that's someone else's full of should. And second, if it's a goal that is yours and you do want to do it, commit to no zero days. Even if it's 30 seconds before midnight, is there something you could still do to move the needle forward on your goal the tiniest amount? Even if it's just to remind yourself that, yes, I do this. Maybe your plant-based goal or your vegan challenge has been more challenging (laughs) than you expected. Or maybe you plan to share your recipes on uh, social media or to seek out a vegan publisher to be more public as an activist or start a vegan business. Maybe you haven't been moving forward on that. I'm telling you, I tell everybody every week, coaching has been the best way I've ever seen to reframe these normal things that can be difficult and create a strategy that allows you to make progress on what you do really want. Usually we just need to tweak your systems a tiny bit for you to start seeing a lot of momentum. Now, okay, next week to finish up January, we'll talk more about my personal and professional goals for this year going forward, which have a bit of a new spin on them. But please, no matter where you are with your plans, Keep these two ideas in mind, these two tools. Is it your goal or is it full of should? And if you do love your goal, how can you protect it? How can you keep it front of mind with a commitment to no zero days? Okay, kids, I'm here when you're ready to see how much coaching can change the course of your life. (laughs) I'm here. But until next week, veg your best. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, and that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So, until next week, make it easy and veg your best.